What makes us human? It is the way we perceive things. It's the way we try to make sense of it all. And it is the way in which we ask questions. What you just witnessed was one minute of footage of images and sounds that were assembled by a team of artists and scientists and thinkers led by Carl Sagan in the 1970s. You know Carl Sagan? He was an astronomer and he thought a lot about stuff out there, maybe alien life. And actually, these images, they were burned onto a gold-plated disks, and they were put on two spacecraft called the Voyagers. These space missions were launched in the 1970s, 77, on their way to the outer solar system to see the giant planets. And they were never going to return. They were going to continue into the vast, empty space. Now, maybe one day, an alien or a group of aliens will find this spacecraft the size of a small car, and if they manage to decipher the manual, then they will see these images, if they have eyes, and they will be able to hear greetings in 55 human languages. This is Dutch. So there's 55 languages on there saying, hello, aliens. This brings us to the question that we humans ask, ask, are we alone in the universe? And in order to answer this question, as an astrophysicist, I'm going to give you a small crash course in astronomy. Are you ready? Okay, so what is a star? A star is a giant sphere of gas that is so hot and dense in its interior that it can convert simpler elements into more complex elements. And we call this process nuclear fusion. And this is what helps the stars to keep on shining. Now, stars are the light beacons of our cosmos, and all the light that we see at night, except for our own artificial light, comes directly or indirectly from the stars. Stars are very hot on their surface, so we don't expect to find life there. But we could find life on a planet. A planet is a spherical object that orbits around a star. We live on planet Earth. We know of several planets in our solar system, but so far we only found life on Earth. On a planet, we can expect to find life if the conditions are met. Planets are orbited by moons. We have one moon, the moon, but some other planets have tens of moons, like Jupiter and Saturn. And actually, if conditions are met on a moon, you could also expect, maybe, to find life there. Now, we only found life on our own planet, so we take ourselves a bit as, as the measuring stick for life elsewhere. Maybe this is a very short-sighted thing to do, maybe it's pretentious to do that for us as humans, that we think that life might be connected in a way or, or developed similarly as we did, but that's what we are going to do. Now, there could be planets circling our other stars. We call these planets exoplanets or extrasolar planets. And all these stars and their planets and their moons and everything that orbits them, they flock together in giant islands of stars, which we call galaxies. A typical galaxy contains a hundred billion stars. So that's a number that's hard to imagine. In our galaxy, which might look like this one, we are actually living in the outskirts. And maybe that's a good thing, because at the center of the galaxy, we think there is a giant black hole. So conditions are not so good there. Now, if we look far out in the visible universe, this is a picture taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. We see many, many galaxies. Actually, in the visual universe, we have hundreds of billions of galaxies. And each of them contains hundreds of billions of stars. So you can do a little calculation on the back of an envelope, and you can conclude that, in fact, in the visible universe, there are more stars than there are grains of salt on all the beaches and in all the deserts of Earth altogether. 
So that's a lot of potential stars to have planets, right? Now, as an astrophysicist, this night sky is my playground, but I have one big problem, and that is that everything is very far away. But light is traveling very fast. It's the fastest thing that we know, actually. The light of the sun left the sun eight minutes ago before it reaches us. The light of the next star, the neighboring star to the sun, left that star four years ago, then traveled all the way to reach the Earth. So actually, we see that star as it was four years ago. So when we look up at night, in fact, we are looking into history. Everything we see comes from the past, because life ta light takes time to travel here. Now, using that light, we can come to a new distance scale. For example, we can say that our sun is located at a distance of eight light minutes, and the neighboring star is located at a distance of four light years. Now, for all these stars very far out, might there be planets or moons circling around them that host life? But then the next question is, what is life? What do you consider something alive? Something that's breathing, something that's exchanging information or energy with its environment, something that's procreating, something that's communicating. In fact, in all the different scientific disciplines, there's a lot of discussion about what it means to be something alive. But you see things, certain properties coming again, like evolving exchanging energy with the environment. And if we look just on our own planet, on Earth, we see that there's a huge variety of life. You have mono monocellular organisms, very basic life that is even hard to see with a microscope. And then you have civilizations that are even capable of launching rockets into space. And somewhere in between, on this planet, we had the dinosaurs. And if they would still be around, we might not be here. So there's a variety of life. And on the tree of life, we humans are just a small branch, a branch that is definitely going to evolve and that maybe will fall off. But if we use ourselves and planet Earth as a measuring stick, then we have to see how did life start here. And this is an image, artist's impression, how it might have started. About 4.6 billion years ago, there was a gigantic revolving pancake that was actually matter, dust and gas that remained after some previous stars had died. And from this rotating disk, actually at the center, our sun condensed and it started shining. From the rest of the disk, the planets formed among which our own planet. And actually, on our own planet, very early, there was water, liquid water. And we think that this liquid water played a key role in the development of life here. Now, if we take this liquid water as a measuring stick or as, as a reference, then we can say, OK, if a planet to host life, it needs liquid water, then we can actually see in a solar system in a system of planets around a star, where can we have liquid water? Now, if the planet is too close to the star, then if there's water, maybe it will evaporate because it's too hot. If it's too far out, the liquid water will freeze, so it's not liquid anymore. So there is a zone, a zone around any star in which water, if it's there, it could be liquid. And this zone is what we call the habitable zone. From when you look up at the sky, you see many stars, and then you could start wondering which of these stars have planets, and are any of these planets, if they're there, in the habitable zone? Could they have liquid water? Actually, so far, we have found many planets, and to date, we have thousands of them. But the problem in finding these exoplanets is that they don't shine light themselves. They just reflect light from the stars. And at these enormous distances, this reflected light is barely visible. 
So we actually need to think of clever techniques to decipher or to unravel the presence of a planet from the light of the star. We see the light of the star. And there's two main ways in which we do this. This is the first one. What you see here is gravity in action. You see the star, that's the only object we actually can see in the visible light, and then you see the planet revolving it. By gravity, actually, the planet pulls the star as well as the star pulls the planet. So this makes the star wobble a bit. We call this technique the wobble technique. And with specific kinds of observations, we can figure out whether a star is wobbling. And in this way, we found the first planet circling another star, the first exoplanet, 25 years ago. Now, today, there's another technique that's used a lot. And what we do is what you see here. So you see that a planet sometimes might cross the surface of the star. We can only witness this, of course, if the orientation of the planetary system is right, if we look along the line of the planets crossing the star. Now, if this happens, when the planet crosses, we actually see, for a brief moment, less light of the star. So we see a small dip in the light emitted by the star, and we call this a transit. And this is what we call the transit technique. And with this technique, we have found thousands of planets in the past years. Actually, to date, I checked this morning, we have 4,187 exoplanets that have been found. And of these exoplanets, a few tens of them are located in the habitable zone. So they might host liquid water. But the fact that they are in the habitable zone doesn't mean that they're inhabited. To know if there's really life there, we have to go a step further. They're far away, so we cannot really find them directly. We can't see the life directly, but we can again look at what is it on Earth. On Earth, in our atmosphere, you have some gases that are typical for life. We have water, we have oxygen, we have ozone. These are what we call biomarkers. Now, we can think of clever, clever ways to unravel the composition of the atmosphere of the planet from the light of the star. And that's the way in which we are going to see if there might be these gases on the other planets. We are starting to do this and expect to hear a lot more about this in the coming, say, 10 years. So that is how we astrophysicists are now looking for places where there might be life. But on the other hand, you might say maybe this is even intelligent life, and maybe they communicate. And then again, if we look at ourselves, for the past century, we have been communicating, and we have been using radio waves for communication. We are sending, actually, our soaps and our songs into space, and they're leaving our Earth at the speed of light. Now, maybe an alien civilization is doing the same, and maybe we can detect it. And that is what the project SETI is all about. SETI stands for the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And what they're trying to do is to find signs of intelligent communication coming from elsewhere. We use radio dishes for that. And so far, we have found some interesting signals, but nothing to be certainly a proof of alien intelligent life. Now, of course, we started only 50 years ago, so this is really at the start. But you might wonder why this radio si silence? Why don't we find it immediately? Well, one thing to consider is that we started doing this 100 years ago. This means that we are detectable up to 100 light years. Things are very far away. Our sun is at eight light minutes, the neighboring star at four light years, the edge of our own galaxy at 75,000 light years, and the neighboring galaxy at two and a half million light years. Now, by the time our signals, our soap operas, our music reaches that distance, we will probably not be around anymore. And that is also something that a quote on the Voyager Golden Discs refers to. President Jimmy Carter wrote a letter to possible alien civilizations that might find our disks. 
And in this letter, he wrote, we are trying to survive our times so we can live into yours. What we have to consider is the finite lifetime of a civilization, an intelligent or a so-called intelligent civilization, because it may be capable of destroying itself. So let's come back to the question, are we alone? From an astrophysics point of view, if you consider all these grains of sand that we compare to stars on all the desert and all the beaches of the Earth altogether, from all this wealth of possible places, we have only picked up a small children's hand. And in this hand, we have found thousands of planets. If you consider the variety of life out there, I think it would be really amazing if there would be no life out there. The Voyager is continuing its voyage into space. It's been more than, it's now 23 years that it's on the way and it's left our solar system a few years ago. It will take 40,000 years until it reaches the next star. And maybe it will be found, but probably not. It will continue its journey. Everything is very far away, so on the question, are we alone, I today would answer, I think they are there, but they're also alone. Thank you.